Well, good day and welcome back to the shed. At the end of part one of this uh, little Chrysler, uh, I had it going nicely and then it unaccountably just stopped working or oh, went to very, very low volume. And uh, I couldn't figure out what was going on with it. Um, I plugged it in again and it came back to life, which was as big a problem as it's not working because I didn't know why it came back to life. I had a feeling it was some kind of mechanical fault, but I uh, wasn't too sure what, but I took advantage of it working and wrote down all the uh, the voltages that it was uh, getting um, when it was working properly so that I could compare them with what happened next time the fault recurred, but I couldn't get it to go bad again. I knew there was something wrong, so I tried the, um, the freeze that didn't work on anything. I tried tapping various components until I tapped one of the electrolytics that I'd just soldered in and uh, it turned out to be um, my own terrible soldering on on uh, fitting that electro. I'll show you what it was. Uh, so I found that by tapping this electro I could make the fault recur and uh, looking at the soldering uh, I don't know what I was thinking it must have been late or it must have been tired or maybe I'm just plain stupid but uh, if you move the wires aside look at that there's a big drip of solder down just about touching the chassis. So um, yeah I'll just sucker that up and it should fix the problem. Okay there we go. So let's plug it in and um, just prove a point and make sure that it is working. Meanwhile, Port Hutton came from behind to beat the Lions by nine goals, and Sydney were too good for the Suns on the Gold Coast. Corbin Middlemass, ABC Sport, Melbourne. Well, that seems to be working okay now, which doesn't surprise me. Well, since it's going fine, there's nothing much else to do but uh, get on with the recap, so I may as well do that. And I'll come back when I've finished, and uh, we've got on with cleaning it up and an alignment and uh, all the good stuff shut the uh, capacitor to keep crap out of it. I've um, masking taped over the valve sockets and uh, I'll start with a good, a good dose of uh, kitchen cleaner just to give it a, a soak and take the surface crap off. I don't know if this will make any difference at all but uh, it's a good start. Sometimes it uh, works wonders, sometimes it doesn't. So I'll just work that around a bit. Um, Oh my god, look at the bottom of the tuning drum there, that's <laughs> encrusted. I'll go a bit down in there. At least this will get the dirt off, I don't think it's going to do much with the rust, but um, at least after that it'll be cleaner rust. Okay, I'll let that soak for a few minutes. Come back and uh, see if it's made any difference anyway. Well that stuff does seem to be doing something. In some places it's leaving like a dull grey metal surface here and taking the surface rust off. In fact I'm not at all sure that this is rust. It seems to be quite soluble. I don't know. I don't want to think about what it is or I won't be doing this. I was halfway through cleaning it and uh, not very successfully and I thought I'd put it on test and make sure I hadn't done anything silly and um, well it's not um, working as it should it's still giving me trouble I'm getting very low audio volume that's a strong station and that's full volume now it's not the amplifier stage because if I touch the pickup input um, that's a pretty good robust hum, so I think it's in the RF stage somewhere. So what I'm going to do is uh, turn it upside down, feed a signal into it and just see how far that gets and where the 
see if I can work out where the problem is. So um, I'll turn it upside down and I'll come back and see what we can come up with. Okay, we've got it upside down and uh, I thought I'd start by just establishing what's what around the place and that is not as straightforward as I'd hoped. Okay, so this is the mixer oscillator valve here. Um, the circuit diagram shows it's an ECH35. Is that? I can hardly read it. Um, anyway, um, in this case it's a 6SA7, which is a different valve. Um, nevertheless, we've got a lead coming in from the tuning gang here, which will be the oscillator gang. Goes through this resistor and this cap, which check out with the schematic. But uh, the curious thing is that that goes to pin one, two, three, four, pin five of the um, 6SA7. Now, pin five of the 6SA7 is the um, is grid one. Okay. Now, according to the schematic, the oscillator goes to grid three of the mixer oscillator. Um, but pin 5 is clearly grid 1 of the 6SA7. I don't know if that makes a, a difference. Um, I guess that um, grid 3 of the 6SA7 will be connected to the RF input. So grid 3 of the 6SA7 is on pin 8. So let's just see what we've got on pin 8. And here we are pin 8 goes up this yellow wire and to the tuning gang and then switched into I guess the aerial coil uh, checking the schematic here yeah, that is right it's connected directly to the tuning gang so yeah so the grids are swapped instead of the um, the oscillator going to grid 3 and the RF going to grid 1 it's the other way around now I'm not suggesting that's wrong it's just that everything in this radio seems to be different to what's on the schematic. It's really hard sometimes to know what's going on. Uh, the value of this resistor which is attached to the oscillator via um, this, this little 50 puff uh, mica which is correct according to the schematic 80 ohms and it's supposed to be 20. I can't read the markings on the resistor so I'm not sure what it's supposed to be. The schematic says 20. Um, it's not 20. But we'll, I'll, I'll ignore that for the moment because I'm really not sure what's supposed to be there. This, this radio differs significantly from this schematic anyway. The service manual I have shows nine different variations of the chassis and I still can't work out which one I have. It seems to be one of the later ones and a hybrid between eight and nine. I don't know. So the plate of the mixer oscillator is on pin three and that's logical because it's going to the first uh, IF coil there. Um, what I might do is just power it up briefly and just see what voltage we got on the plate. Okay, well I've got it powered up. Now see what we've got there. And 202 volts on the plate. That looks healthy enough. I thought while I'm at it I'd check the plate voltage on the 6SK7. That's the first IF valve and it's also 203 so that's healthy enough. So it's not voltage related. Just notice there's a spider's nest down there. I might just um, haul that out. This will this will do. Come on, out you come. There we go. Little ball of spider's eggs. This is great. This this um, toothbrush for people with one tooth. Very useful in some circumstances. I got it from my local meth dealer. Okay, so I've got the old leader set up for um, 600 uh, kilohertz, and um, on the lowest output I can reasonably get out of it. So that's on 0.1 of a volt per division, and it's a quarter of a division. So what's that? Um, about 25 millivolts or something like that. Uh, I'm going to feed that into the aerial. Uh, I know it's higher than anything you'd expect at the aerial, but it's probably the best I can do. And uh, we'll see if I can trace it through. And I'm going to feed it into the aerial wire. Oh, that's the where the aerial goes on to the coil there. Yep, 
and uh, I'll turn it on and just see if we can pick up the signal somewhere. The 600 it should be um, along the low end of the dial there somewhere but I'll just wait till we get some warm-up happening. Got it on max volume. Okay so the audio section's happening. I should be able to now tune this There it is. Now that should be blasting through. Uh, it's not very loud at all. So now I'll see if we can find it on the scope, uh, find it on the grid of the mixer oscillator for a start. So remembering the RF was being fed into grid 3 which is on pin 8. So there it is there. And I'll just attach the scope to that. The capacitor is just to block any DC. That's pulling it down a bit, but I can still hear it. And I can see the waveform there, and it looks quite distorted. I'm not sure what's going on there. There's something else superimposed on it. But um, it's there. And that would be one and a half division, so that's point uh, point one of a volt so point one five of a volt at that point okay so next I'm going to have a look at the plate of the mixer oscillator now to put the clip on this I'm going to turn the power off and make sure that the plate voltage is dropped yep before I touch it um, also making sure this isn't going to short anything get this right away from everything that looks safe enough it's not going to not touching anything it shouldn't I'll just move it up a little bit here yeah that looks safe enough all right turning it on and wait till we can hear the noise again okay and now on the scope I've turned that down to one volt per division and that's just over one volt peak to peak signal we're getting in there Okay, so I know the signal's making it through the mixer oscillator valve. Um, I won't bother checking the oscillator. We know the oscillator's running because it is tuning stations, so I'm not too concerned about that. So I'll turn that off we'll and I'll see if I can trace it through the uh, IF transformer. So that's off. Just removing this. Now it runs through the IF transformer and comes out uh, on pin 4, the secondary goes to pin 4 of the first IF valve, that's this um, that's this 6SK7 so we should see the output of the IF transformer on that pin so let's uh, turn it on again and see what we get ok so I've got the scope connected by this cap to the plate of the second IF valve the uh, 6SK7 so that's at 1 to 1 volt per division now and we're getting about yeah 1.25 volts peak to peak on the plate of the uh, the first IF tube so it appears to be working okay so I've got an output from the first IF valve let's just check for continuity across the um, second IF coil and what do we got there 7.1 ohms there on the primary um, and on the secondary what do we got 7.1 ohms on the secondary all right so let's see what's happening happening with the second IF valve so here we've got the secondary of the second IF and it's going into the um, the next tube what what is that anyway to 6BD7 so that's going into that that's attaching to the diode of the 6BD7 um, the other side of the coil will go through this resistor 
through the link to the um, for the pickup input and into the bottom of the the, the pot. So uh, just check we got continuity through all of that. Um, but if so, we might be looking at that second IF tube. Um, not that I've got a replacement for it, but we'll see. Okay, so we have continuity across the, uh, the coil. That goes to the diode. Um, doesn't go anywhere else from there. The other side of the coil through this resistor, which is fairly high value green, black and orange, that's 50, 50k. So we should be seeing 50k through there, 55. Um, okay, so that seems to be doing what it should be doing. Other side of that link we should be also seeing exactly the same, 55. I don't suppose the pot's faulty, we should be seeing about the same here too. 55, yep, um, that will go up as I turn the pot, yep, sure does. 55 from here, the wiper of the pot goes through this cap, which I replaced, and that will go onto the grid. And of course we won't see anything on the meter, but there we are. 55 there, we should be getting a signal on the grid here. So what I'll do is I'll put the scope on that and see what we're getting at that grid. Uh, one of the most annoying things about intermittent faults is that just when you think you're tracing them through they disappear and now that signal is <coughs> screaming in and I'm sure if I turned the radio on it would boom into life and work perfectly. I suppose what I could do is, with it working perfectly, I could check what the outputs are um, against what I've already measured. I'm really not sure what else I can do, but uh, with it working it's pretty hard to trace a fault. I guess what I'll do is I'll go back to the plate of that um, first IF. That's the, um, the 6SK7 and we'll just see what we've got on the plate now and uh, yeah about one and a half volts of course that's um, no audio volume but that the audio volume doesn't make any difference to this we're looking at the RF coming through and it's still at the same level it was before so I'm assuming the fault isn't there okay so now we're looking at the um, second IF output and that goes to the diode of the uh, second IF valve so what we're seeing here is a very small RF component in it. That's 0.1 per division, so that's that's minute. Uh, and that slope on it, I guess, is the um, the audio modulation. So if we change the time base down, there we go. There's our audio waveform. Well, now of course it's going perfectly. Uh, so oh, no, hang on. We, did I just drop a call? We didn't. Oh no, hang on. Just but just one second. Let's get back to Zach. G'day, Zach. Yeah, we're ready to go when you are. Here we go. All right, so, um, well done. Question number 17. We're in Baker's. Move, if you like, or we'll stay there. Let's stay with Baker's. Baker's is. Used in baking, what is the common name? Well, that's going very well, and that's only on a little, a little bit of volume. Um, so I don't know. I might try yeah. it on short Correct. Wave, hey? Okay, we're going on to short wave, and I don't know what we'll get, but... Very hard to short, tune short wave with your hand on the capacitor. Yeah, 
Yeah, anyway, short wave's obviously working well. Go back to medium wave. Is as effective. Whitaker with Catholicism, and when I spent some out to the public as go. Well, uh, I only know about the uh, the Melbourne storm. So, uh... well, there you go. What can you do? The only problem is that I suspect the fault will reappear when I least expect it. Okay, I've been a bit busy, but I didn't video all of it. I've um basically just rubbed this back with um, sandpaper, the worst part to the rust, and I've given it a coat of rust converter. And I'm waiting for that to do its magic. It's slowly starting it to turn black. And uh, I'll just give it a coat of some um, some protective nature, something like um, zinc uh, coating or something over that. I'm not going to try and make it pretty because um, this chassis isn't seen. So um, I will... Um, persevere with this and get it as good as I can anyway. Meanwhile I've also restrung the dial. Fortunately the service data that I downloaded from Kevin Chance website included a dial stringing diagram and I was looking at this and the more I looked at it the more puzzled I became. In fact this radio does not follow this diagram. This has two cords, one around the spindle shown from the back as on the right so that's the correct position it has a spring to tension that and a loop around there, that's fine. It also has a second cord, well that's cord number two. Cord number one is the one that drives the pointer and it goes around the drum and back onto the start. It doesn't have a spring on it, but what it does have is this jockey pulley here. And that I presume is a strung pulley, sprung pulley it seems to have, be on a pivot there somewhere and pushed outwards. This radio doesn't have that. It has a, a fixed pulley here but it, that pulley doesn't provide any tension on the dial cord. It's not sprung in any way and the way this dial cord was strung is that it was one continuous cord. It went around here then around there and essentially used the original spring, the spring on the main drum, to tension the entire cord which kind of makes sense. Um, so I've had to do it a different way and um, I essentially go around here, along here, over the jockey pulley or the, the fixed pulley that's there and diagonally back up over the drum. I had to do that to get the, um, the direction of travel right. Uh, now that wasn't as difficult as I thought. There was a break in the dial string but the rest of it was in pretty good condition. So I simply replaced the section from the pointer um, around the pulley and back up to the drum. The rest of it's the original dial string which is in fine condition. What I'm doing here is I'm just centralizing the uh, the pointer and it was a little bit out um, so this is the position it should be at the left end of travel and I think the best way to do that to achieve that is to uh, adjust the drum rather than on the spindle rather than to try and move the pointer because that looks rather difficult. So I'm hoping this will be straightforward. There's a single screw down here which um, attaches the drum to the spindle here. Now I've loosened that so if I hold this I should be able to just wind the pointer back Yep, to my second mark. Then I'll tighten it, tighten the screw up. <laughs> Sounds like the neighbours are drunk again. Okay, so now I'll just mark where that ends. And that should be forty millimeters from the end. And it is forty millimeters from that end. And that is 40 millimeters from that end. So that's centralized. Take the tape off now. Another thing I'm going to have to look at is this flocking on the front of the um, dial plate and it's faded to a yellow color. Um, so I'll get to that tomorrow. It's getting a bit late tonight. 
So tomorrow when the rust converter's finished its doing its job, I'll give that a clean off and uh, it should be ready to go back into its cabinet. Uh, unfortunately, its cabinet is not yet ready to receive it. So I'll have to do some polishing and cleaning on that as well. So just looking at the dial and it has a set pointer mark. Beautiful, uh, which I didn't know about, but um, hopefully that will line up. In fact, I'll check it just holding it here centralized on the chassis and it lines up perfectly look at that set pointer so that's nice okay I guess I better explain what happened um, <laughs> I turned it on again fully expecting it to be working and uh, it stopped I was just going to do a little bit more circuit tracing on it um, so seeing the fault had recurred I um, started tracing the circuit through again. I was trying to get a handle on what was going on with uh, tracing it through with the oscilloscope and I touched the tone control knob and again it came good. And I recall that when I, the first time this happened I touched the tone control and uh, it came good after that. We're getting very weak reception there. <coughs> That was the tone control I just touched. Obviously very dirty. So looking at the schematic, here's that tone switch. Now it takes the um, output from the plate of the 6M5 via this resistor R65 to the um, the wiper of the switch and that then either feeds a, a portion of the full output or via this capacitor um, or via a resistor in this capacitor to basically the cathode of the um, detector valve the preamp detector so what it's doing uh, it's filtering out the base and applying the treble only to the cathode which will cancel out the high frequencies being applied to the grid via the volume pot here. I was looking at this and I realized that if this was shorted to ground it would effectively ground the cathode of the um, triode detector and I'm wondering if that's what's happened. So I pulled the switch apart to look at any possibilities uh, of where it could be grounded the switch spindle is isolated from the chassis and that's always a scary thing because you only need a nut to slip or something like that uh, and you've got the thing grounded. And I'm wondering if the spindle of that switch is grounding uh, and causing this problem. So I've got the switch here and I pulled it apart and cleaned it but essentially the switch spindle is attached to this part of the switch, what I call the wiper I guess, uh, and that is attached via this terminal here to the cathode or effectively to the cathode of the um, preamp. Now it's got this steel washer here, a fibre insulation washer, another small fibre insulation washer which sits in the hole in the chassis. On the outside it has this fibre insulation washer and the chassis obviously sits in that slot that groove between the two of them there. We have um, one of these, I don't know what you call them, they're everywhere, and this and that attaches to the chassis. That should isolate it from the chassis but if the slightest bit of dirt or wire or anything metal got in there and shorted this to the chassis. Uh, it will be curtains, it would, uh, it would short it. So I'm going to put this back together rather carefully and make sure that nothing's earthing. Okay, putting it back in and it did seem to click into place with that um, isolation washer in the chassis. So just checking one more time that it's uh, not grounding at all. And it's not going to ground if I twist or move it at all. 
No. Nothing grounded there. That is not going to the chassis. All right, we're on dim bulb because I've been messing with it. Turn it on. And uh, we wait for a bit of warm up to happen. Good to go, even knowing all these trials under my belt. And I'd ridden track work for the last two and a half months. Uh, yeah, I was, I was actually uh, ready to go, but but uh, the muscle on my thigh took took about three years to come back to normal. So uh, that's how long. It was. And, well, the tone uh, control seems to be doing what it should do. That's what I did because uh, I rode three group ones uh, back season. Maximum treble Let's cut talk about there. Some of the highlights. That's obviously one of the more disappointing no moments. No treble cut through there. That. Terrible fall at Mooney and Valley. And through the resistor we'll touch there. On, uh, the incident at Stony Creek, which did ultimately end your career in the saddle shortly. But your three group ones in that season. Tell us about some of those. Reflect on some of them. 22 degrees. This is Earth's 882 6PR. This is the night shift with Russell Collette for Todd Johnston. Yeah. Riding fifty kilos uh, on them two horses, to, so that way the firming capacity is the hamstring our best firming source available right now. Jake. Okay, well I'm going to turn it on again in a minute and leave it on soak test for a while longer. Um, while it's doing that, I might just uh, see what I can do to further clean up the chassis. I know this will cause horror among some people but what I'm doing is I'm actually brush painting the chassis with aluminium paint um, over the rust converted areas and then I thought decided it was going to look better if I just did it evenly over the lot and it is in fact possible because I'm never going to get a very smooth finish on this chassis anyway it's too rough and I'm finding it is in fact possible to get a reasonably easy even finish just with a brush and you can actually work around things like rivets and valve bases without having to mask them and masking takes forever with one of these things I'm kind of thinking for for chassis that are not ever going to be pretty it's probably not a a, a bad option Well there you go, I've seen worse looking painted chassis. I've seen better ones too. <laughs> I've finally got around to giving the speaker a coat of paint and um, just matte black or I think it was satin black and I cut a piece of felt to put in the middle here. Um, I didn't have black felt so that'll have to do but uh, no one's going to see it anyway. But I have to say it does look a lot better than it did when we started and um, the important thing it sounds a lot better too. I'm just about to try and put the dial glass back on and I've got some rubber to mount it on um, it mounts with these little clips that also hold the globes in um, but before I do that I need to do something about this faded flocking on the front plate here and uh, the idea I had was I've got this um, this brown felt that I bought bought it from China <laughs> and it's um, it's not great quality it's not terribly soft I had intended to use it for uh, turntable mats on uh, antique gramophones but it's not the right colour but even worse the size I misinterpreted the sizing and it's actually way too narrow to be used on a turntable um, so I'll use it for this now the next thing is what I'm going to do to get rid of this flocking so that the glue will stick the felt to the um, to the dial backing and uh, one idea I had, and I have no idea if this will work or not, but uh, I thought I'd try and shave it. So I've got a disposal razor here and I'm going to give it a go. Nah. The 
does work but not well enough. Oh, it is kind of working. Yeah, if I do that. It's going to make a mess. That seems to be working reasonably well actually. Strangely enough the faded stuff is coming off and the dark stuff is not. Not so well anyway. I'm going to have to move it off the station here. Okay, so for the rest of it I'm just going to use a, a plain razor blade and shave it with that. Yeah, that seems to work quite well. Well, I'm certainly taking it off anyway. It's peeling a lot off, glue and all. Now I guess I'd better vacuum that up. Okay, well here goes. Put some contact adhesive on it. I'd use spray adhesive but unfortunately I'm out of it. And uh, it's late at night now and uh, I'm not going to be able to buy any. This seems to be doing the job though. too long to go off because um, I won't be able to move it at all once it sticks. Let that go tacky for a minute though. I think I measured it this way. Anyway. I'll put a little bit of grease on there too. Okay, doesn't look too bad. Now to put the glass back on. Uh, I've cleaned the outside of it pretty well. The inside unfortunately does have some dirt on it and in, um, impregnated in that dirt is little bits of that flocking that was on the dial here. Uh, I don't want to risk taking it off. It's not too bad but um, and I don't think it'll be noticeable with the dial on but nevertheless um, I'll, uh, I'm not going to take any risk with it. So I've got a couple of these pieces of rubber which are approximately what was on it before. Something like that. Uh, I'll put another one on the other side. You can see the mark where the old one was so that's pretty easy. The uh, original rubbers were hard and crunchy and certainly not usable again. So starting on the left because that's where I happen to be I'll put the dial lamp thing over mm, easier said than done but I'll press it over anyway and see if I can push the bottom half in That looks successful, except the glass is maybe a little bit low. Okay, now I'll try and do the same on this side. Okay, I think that's pretty much all right. Well it's been singing away for a couple of days now and um, no problems that I can find. Um, this is actually 6AX that we're listening to. It's a difficult station to get without interference and noise so it's performing quite well. Um, I did do a brief check of the uh, alignment, at least the uh, the IF alignment. I didn't get anything out of it. It was, it was on where it should be. 
And as far as the RF is concerned, well, the dial, the stations are lining up where they should be on the dial, so I'm going to leave that side of it alone as well. Um, the chassis hasn't turned out too badly. It's uh, considering it's uh, uh, the state it was in. It's um, yeah, it was brush painted as you saw, but it's turned out quite neatly. I've also been polishing up the cabinet, and it's turned out pretty good. The Bakelite was very dull, and I can't bring it up to a high shine, although I've given it several polishes with uh, with metal polish and one of Brasso. It's still not as good as I'd like it. I might, once I've got the chassis back uh, in the cabinet, uh, try and uh, give it a coat of Canuba wax or, or furniture wax or something. I think that will bring it up to a, a nice shine. But for the moment, that's, that's how it's turned out, raw, I guess. Well, there's the speaker bolted in and uh, I found some grill cloth that'll do, it's just black. I didn't have anything really suitable, but it's hardly seen through the uh, grill anyway, so it's not that critical. So now I um, have to turn the chassis upside down and uh, carefully lower it into the cabinet, hopefully without damaging anything. Right, here goes. Now, before we go too far, I have to feed these um, speaker wires through. If I can grab all three of them with between my fingers and pull them through. There we go. All right, that's pretty much in its final resting place, I think. Okay, so I think everything's in correctly. Um, the case now, putting the lid on. Get that aerial wire caught in there. Okay, I think that's that. I've even got some little felt feet to go on this, although I don't think they're quite the right size. There's something like what would have been on it originally, so I'll put them on. Okay, well, <coughs> the moment of truth has arrived. Turn it upside down and see how it goes. No, oh, I still have to put the knobs on. Unfortunately, I broke one of the knobs taking it off. Uh, they were very, very tight and I had to prise it off with a screwdriver and um, the collar has broken out of the knob. Uh, so I'll be putting that together with a bit of JB Weld and um, whatever and letting it set overnight. Just uh, giving it a final polish with uh, furniture wax and it is coming up very nicely I've got to say. Uh, I was worried about not getting any sort of shine on this Bakelite, but it's uh, it's got a lovely colour to it now. So um, that's good. I still have to wait till tomorrow for the uh, adhesive to dry on this knob, and then we should be good. I was a bit worried when I was fitting the uh, new dial lights that um, they weren't really illuminating the dial very much, at least they didn't look as if they were. 
they shine on the edge of the glass and I couldn't see how much illumination would get through there but now turning the light off um, and I don't know if you'll see it on camera but it actually doesn't look too bad so there we go on the what if app, what if it's all for trouble? Want to know the secret to feeling happy at home? It's having neighbours you love knowing. Book the life. Join us for a tour and discover the joy of retirement in a community that cares. Call one 800 Well, there it is, all polished up, back in its cabinet and working really well, I've got to say. Uh, you never know with intermittent faults, though. Um, it hasn't acted up for quite some time now. It's been a couple of days. But I'm going to uh, put it in the kitchen and uh, use it as a kitchen radio for a while until uh, the owner's ready to pick it up. I do think though that uh, that tone switch issue probably was the cause of the problems all along. Anyway, it's been uh, a little bit longer than expected this one, but thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it and uh, we'll be along soon with uh, another interesting radio. So hopefully we'll catch you then.